Hi everybody, welcome to the channel, which is called Ham Radio, dude. And I've been getting a lot of questions asking about my gear lately. What kind of gear do you carry with you while portable? And will you show us how to set it up? And although I'm not necessarily the best person to ask, it's kind of cool to get different insights. So let's do that. Let's uh, show you my equipment, let's set it up. And along the way, I'll talk about a few things I wanted to tweak or add, or some things that I might tweak or add along the way. Now this is geared to help people who might be new into radio who are looking to get out there and go start doing portable radio. I also encourage you to check out my video where I failed completely at Parks on the Air because I forgot gear and I didn't test it beforehand, which I always highly recommend doing so. And the first thing I bring with me usually is a friend, so let's go check out my friend. <laughs> and if you like this video, consider liking, commenting, and subscribing for me and Scully. And uh, what is inside the bag is the main question, right? going to start off with what's in my bag for my radio and it's a Yaesu FT891. I want to mention I'm not sponsored or endorsed by anybody but I've been using this radio now for quite a few years and it has become my primary radio while portable because it's a relatively lightweight radio that has a 100 watt capability if needed. Typically I only operate at about 50 watts if not 25 watts. And it's for HF only, of course, so I should probably point that out, with the exception of 6 meters, which is VHF. On top, you might notice a button here, and this button replaces the FH2 keypad, kind of. I have it programmed for one slot, so when I hit the button, it's an auto CQ caller for me. It will help me save my voice, which I don't know if you could tell I've been having issues with lately. And of course, now we have to have the radio hooked up to something, so we're going to put an antenna up in the air. And how are we going to do that? First of all, it's about deciding what you're going to put up for an antenna. In my videos, I've shown vertical antennas, I've shown dipoles, I've, so many different antennas. Uh, I keep going back to the tried and true end-fed half wave. So I'll usually carry that. And sometimes I'll carry a backup as well, just in case something happens. Everything I do, with the exception of the, the transceiver, I typically have some kind of backup on. Now, if I didn't have any way to hoist up my antenna, I noticed that there's some trees up here. Maybe I try to throw the wire through that portion of the tree so that I have a sloper configuration. Or maybe I throw it over this branch here. There's many options that you could look at as far as trees go. And when you use wire like I do on the antenna I'm about to show you, well, you don't have to worry about it breaking, which is really nice. Now this is the antenna and the counterpoise that I'll use today. So this is an end-fed half wave with a thick toroid. And the reason I could throw it over a tree is this wire is reinforced with fiber. It's a heavy duty wire. It just doesn't break if you pull it apart. And that makes it nice if I need that. Uh, here you'll see I've made a little bit of an extension, just kind of playing around with something. Uh, you could just ignore that for right now. But I also have this compensation coil on here, which I spoke about before, and I put it at about six to eight feet away from the actual toroid itself and I wrap it about 10 times which helps me bring the bands into alignment. 40 might look good but with this 40, 20, 15, and 10 look great. In specific it's needed for this toroid right here and probably a few other toroids as well. And the reason that I'm going to be using counterpoise wire you're going to see in just a few moments. It's not always required although it's probably a good practice. Okay, so we got a radio, we have our antenna, we need to get it in the air somehow, and we could go over a tree, but instead today, I'm going to use my carbon fiber mast. Now, you could use a fishing pole or a fishing rod fiberglass mast. I've done videos on those in the past, like a guitar or a quick stick, I think it's called. But uh, today, I'm going to use the HRD Industries Little Dude 6. Now, this is my typical bag now, because I've been using these things so long. I like them and I put a lot of trust into them. And with that, I need a way to put this into the ground. Maybe I use my new ground spike that I've been kind of playing around with. And that's kind of the fun part about me getting to go portable. A, I live in a HOA, but also I get to come out here and I get to test new ideas, concepts, thoughts, and just projects that I get to build, which I think is the true spirit of amateur radio. About 45 feet from where we are, there's that stump right over there. And if we take a look at the stump, it's almost like not only did they cut it, but they dug a hole around it as if they want to tear it out. 
And I show this to you because maybe you somehow forgot your mast or maybe you forgot your ground spike, whatever it might be. How are you gonna be able to put your antenna mast in the air? And you gotta think about those things. So I would easily be able to put the little dude six, and I know this because I did it yesterday, right in that hole where the trunk is. And if I had 550 cord, which you should always carry 550 cord on you, I could even tie the mast around the tree if I needed to. But like I mentioned today, I did bring the spike. So we're gonna spike this into the ground. And like I said, I'm about 45 feet out from where I'm at. Now I have a 65 roughly foot end fed half wave. So this should be pretty good. You know, my buddy Scully, he's refusing to help. So I'm just trying to hold the camera with my feet. But basically I have this prototype spike I built and I'm going to just screw in the threaded portion here to a JPC12 aluminum spike and I'm going to place it into the ground and hopefully I don't need a hammer or anything like that. But it's always good to test, sorry, it's always good to test these things at home because if you need a hammer it's not like you get out to the field and then you got to go find a rock or something or kind of some way to improvise. But in this situation soil's pretty much soft enough for me to tap it in. But this is a really good thing because as I told you, I like to test things out here and I'm testing out a prototype spike, which I was trying to kick in because it was maybe a little bit harder of soil than I thought. And uh, well, I found a flaw and this means that I can now start working to go home and develop the prototype better so that I'm not maybe telling people to do something that is gonna break something, right? So let's take a look at what broke and how we're gonna adapt to it. Sorry for the shaky camera. We could see that it broke along the lines here. And then of course it is gonna be the weakest point, which I kind of knew about. I could hammer on this thing all day long over here, but as soon as I kick it and it goes like this or like this, or rather the PVC shifts one way or another, it's putting a lot of stress on a certain point. You can see it's really close to where it becomes solid in the middle as well. So I gotta go work on this more. We'll make sure that it's good here soon. And uh, that's the delay on the prototype. But now what do we do to adapt? Because I do have a mast and I told you about 550 cord. Nope, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna use that hole that's over there. And what I was telling you about was that, that little hole right there fits really well. It's gonna bend a little bit, that's fine. You'll notice on the top of this cap here, I actually have an S beaner, which is gonna make sense in a moment while I grab the antenna. Actually, I forgot, I still have another prototype spike. And the last one you saw was printed in a quality called, or a filament called ASA. This is in polycarbonate, which is a little bit, objectively, it's a little bit stronger. So uh, let me go ahead and try to get this in. What you'll see now is I've put the mast over that piece of polycarbonate and PVC. And I have two sections of the mast up. And I'm just going to now slowly start bringing the mast up from here and uh, we should attach the wire to it right now as well. I'm going to actually string out my wire so that it lays pretty much horizontal on the ground all the way out. I mentioned earlier about this s beaner on here, and also right here I have a fish swivel, and actually some fishing line and then another swivel on the antenna wire. So I'm just gonna hook the fishing swivel right into here, and that way when it goes up, it's locked into place. If you're ever looking for some sort of insulator for your antenna wire or some way to connect it to things, I highly recommend that you go read the Army Field Manual. In particular, they have a section about antennas and they have a whole section there about using everyday things or resources you might be able to find in the field in order to use an insulator, like a bottle cap, for example, plastic bottle cap. Starting with the thinnest section, I'm gonna start pulling up the mast and I don't even have to pull on it very hard. I'm just gonna lock it into place until it reaches 20 feet. And then we're gonna go hook up our wire in a sloper configuration. I choose the sloper configuration for a specific reason, which you'll see here in just a second. In the sloper configuration, your antenna goes from your highest point down to the lowest point, And that's where your feed point is. I'm only about two feet off the ground. So I'm gonna have some impedance issues and maybe some weird SWR readings, but off of my experience, it still works. For example, I made a sideband contact last night to the Azores from right here. And uh, to prop this on here, I just found out that there was a piece of the actual trunk that has been cut that fits 
this little shape, this U-shape right here perfectly. And now I'm gonna put my coax in and my radio is gonna sit right here. And that's exactly why I need a counterpoise. This cable right here, it's like two feet or three feet. I got it off of Amazon and it's cheap. But to be honest with you, I've still made contacts around the world. So I don't go out and buy a very expensive cable. I buy a couple of these, one for a backup and then this one. And I'm just gonna plug it in from my antenna to the radio. And of course, this being so short is the reason I want a counterpoise because of Kershaw's law, which I'm not an engineer. You can go ask one of them or watch my prior videos where I explain it. Here is a better angle of that part of the branch I was telling you about. And then there goes my counterpoise wire out. It's right now about 15 feet. I'll probably make it about 18 feet. So let's operate. Oh wait, there's no power because we need a battery or some sort of power source to be able to power this thing. And today I'm gonna to use a bio -eno battery that I've had for quite a few years. Now I did the power pull mod on the back of the 891, which allows you to plug in power poles directly, but I'm not gonna do that because I like inline fuses just in case something happens. I'm not frying my radio and possibly losing all means of communication. Instead, I've been kind of walking around with this huge, huge, huge power box here. Of course, the other thing you could do is just have your inline fuses that you get from Yezu, no problem there. Uh, but I've been liking this box, I've just been testing it out. Again, I like to test things quite a bit and that helps dictate what I carry to the field. Now we can see the bio -eno into the box into another wire that goes in the back of the radio. So if I go over everything, I have my antenna and my mast down to the wire to the feed point or the auto transformer. And then I have my counterpoise, I have my coax, and I have my battery, I have my breaker, if you wanna call it that, and I have my radio. So I should be ready to operate. By the way, there are a few other things I might consider bringing, and these are the things that you'll get along the way and you'll start to build, if you will. You always wanna to add tools to your kit, provided you have enough room and you're not too heavy, but I like to carry some electrical tape with me. This could always come in handy. If I can, I'll carry a SWR meter with me, which today I did not bring. Uh, always carry a pen and a paper. And maybe you carry two pens because I've had situations where my cell phone was dead and my pen ran out of ink. And then, you know, what are you doing at that point? And right here, all I'm doing is I'm listening for an open frequency and I just wanna see if the frequency is in use and really get an idea how my standing wave ratio is. Now I'll start at uh, 48, well, let's start at 50 watts today. Is this frequency in use? Whiskey 9, Fox, Fox, Fox. Nothing hurt. My battery is gonna die, but I, we're pretty much wrapped up. Now, one of the things I wanna point out is this. Practice is important. You have to be able to plan things, write things down, learn how to debrief, whether you're training or you are out actually doing a parks on the air exercise. And that debrief will really help you figure out what your points of weaknesses were, what points were strong, maybe they surprised you, and you can articulate a game plan for the next time that you go out. However, I also wanna point out that maybe your environment dictates the gear that you carry. You know, for example, I'm not going to go into Vietnam the same way I'm going to go into Afghanistan uh, relatively. I mean, we're talking different clothing, possibly different uh, uh, cover or, or concealment, if you will. Concealment would probably be the better word. And it's the same way. I'm probably not going to operate exactly the same out here in the woods as I would uh, at a beach or on a boat. So you need to consider maybe what you're going to be operating on or with or at. And, and maybe adapt to that. And that will come in time. You might get out there one or two times and you might not successfully activate because you forgot something you didn't think you would need. And provided you're just trying to do parks on the air, consider it a learning experience. And then if you ever really do need to use your equipment in a shit hit the fan scenario, you actually have the right equipment out there to use. And the great thing is, is you can never prepare for what the circumstance is actually gonna be when you get there, but all those time practicing and all those times going out to activate and all those times checking your gear back, making lists, debriefing yourself after every time you go out, it makes you strong enough to get into a situation and be able to handle it a little better. I've been very open about the times that I failed, the times that I've almost been in really bad situations, possibly life-threatening situations on my channel, and I point those things out so that maybe you 
even if you do, even if you do make the same mistakes, uh, it's going to prepare you to become better the next time you go out and the next time you go out. You know, what you don't want is you don't want to go out there completely unprepared and then there is no next time. Today I didn't talk about anything like safety equipment, uh, you know, I can't, I'm not giving you any kind of legal advice here, but maybe you carry something to protect yourself because there are crazy people in the parks and uh, there are, I mean, some of these parks got bears in them, for example, right? And, and you got to be careful with all those things, bears, people, and even Scully over here, right? But it is important. I think I've pretty much hit on a lot of things today. It's like, you're going to get out there, you're going to do it. I just hope you have fun and I hope this starts to give you ideas. That's my whole goal here is to give you ideas on how to operate. I don't care if you operate with a vertical antenna, a dipole, whatever works for you. Mm -hmm.